John 5, 24 is going to be our first text this morning. John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that hears my words and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. Shall I come to condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now he tells us of something we can have and never lose, and that's salvation. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. Now, folks, you can't lose something that's everlasting. Everlasting means it never ends. Therefore, if you cannot lose your salvation because it's everlasting, Jesus gives us something that never ends. You say, well, when does it begin? When does salvation begin? It begins at the point of exercising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you do that, you're given everlasting life. That's present tense, not future tense. See, a lot of people have this idea that there's a judgment day we all stand before Christ, and he looks at our life to see whether or not we deserve salvation. They look at it as future tense. They say, you cannot say that you're saved and on your way to heaven. You don't know that. You're not, you'll not know that until judgment day. Well, folks, the Bible doesn't say any such thing. Judgment day is not to determine if you're saved or not. That's determined in this life and what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says you have everlasting life. Now, a lot of folks don't believe that. They don't believe what Jesus says here. They say you can mess up and lose your salvation. It's dependent upon how you live your life. But they're saying they don't believe what Jesus has said here and in many places. He says you have it right now. And what you have is everlasting. Now, you either have salvation or you don't. Amen. There's no halfway in this. You're either saved or you are lost. Now, I'm not going to preach on assurance of salvation. But I want you to think about this. Just because you cannot lose your salvation when you sin... That does not mean that there's not some things you can lose because of sin in your life. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Things a Christian can lose if they allow unconfessed, unforgiven sin in their life. Go to my second text in Romans chapter 6. And let's read beginning with verse number 11. Romans chapter 6 verse 11. It says, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin should not have dominion over you. How can to save people? For you're not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So he said that we are to be dead unto sin. And alive unto righteousness. Don't let sin control your life. Don't let sin have dominion in your life. Because if you do, there are some things you're going to lose. Because of sin. We are dead unto sin. You ever have a, a pet that died? 
One little boy had a goldfish that died. He was heartbroken. He went to his father holding little uh, goldfish in his hand. He said, Daddy, Flipper died. His daddy was concerned for the little fella. And he said, listen, uh, don't be upset. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to have a big funeral for Flipper. We'll have all your friends come over. We'll have cake and ice cream. We'll put Flipper in a little matchbox, and we'll have a burial in the backyard. We'll just have a party with a clown and, and all kinds of games. About that time, Flipper began flipping in the boy's hand. The little boy looked at Flipper, and he looked at his dad. He said, let's kill him. <laughs> he didn't want to miss out on that party. Now, if you had a dog that died in the backyard, would you just leave it there and try to go out every day to feed it? That'd be silly, wouldn't it? But think about this. We are dead indeed unto sin. And we should not try to feed a dead nature that is past. When Jesus saves us from sin... Folks, we're not to keep choosing to sin. As a safe person, you've got two natures. You still got that old sin nature that we got from Adam, but you also have the divine nature you got from Jesus Christ. And it depends on which nature you feed the best as to which way you're going to live. You keep feeding that old sinful nature, you're going to sin. But we don't. I know we cannot be sinless, but we can all sin less. We, we all sin more than we have to, more than we ought to. So let's think about this this morning. When we do sin, we pay the consequences. We're going to reap what we sow. I want to share some things with you that we lose because of unconfessed, unforgiven sin in our life. Are you ready? First of all, you can lose the joy of your salvation. Now, while you cannot lose your salvation, you can lose the joy of your salvation. King David is an example of that. We know he was a man after God's own heart. David was a great man of God. But David allowed sin to come into his life. You know, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Then he had her husband Uriah killed to try to cover it up. Finally, Nathan, the prophet, was sent to David to confront him about the sin in his life. And David confessed his sin and repented, and God forgave him. Now, you know, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. Psalm 51 was a psalm David had written after all this happened. And in that psalm, he talks about the awful consequences of sin that's unconfessed and not repented of. In that psalm, he cries out for mercy. He cries out for forgiveness and for cleansing. He talks about that year he tried to cover that sin up and, and how horrible that year was under conviction. And he says in Psalm 51, 12, Restore unto me the joy. Of thy salvation. And he didn't lose the salvation, but he lost the joy of it. That can happen to us. You can lose the joy of your salvation. And David paid the consequences for this. He not only lost the joy of his salvation, but his family suffered greatly because of this. Stand with him as he looks down on the body of that little baby that died. For him and Bathsheba. Or when he finds out that his daughter was raped by one of her brothers. And how one brother killed another brother. As Absalom got revenge for Tamar and killed Amnon. And Solomon had another brother, Adonijah, executed. There was a lot that went on in David's family. And it was the consequences of the sin that he allowed into his life. Don't tell David there's nothing to lose when you sin. He knows better. 
His son Solomon saw it. And he wrote in Proverbs 13, 15, the way of transgressors is hard. He might have been thinking about David. The way of transgressors is hard. It's not an easy life. Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Do you remember how it was when you first got saved? How excited you were about your new life in Christ and, and how joyful you were about that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you lost that? Have you lost the joy? Is it because of sin in your life that you've not confessed? You can lose the joy of your salvation. Secondly, you can lose your Christian testimony. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, he said, you're the salt of the earth. Talking to his disciples, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Losing your testimony is involved here. You seek to be that salty saint that you need to be. Think about Lot, the nephew of Abraham. You know the story of Lot, how that he had great herds and Abraham had great herds. And, and it got to where there's just not enough room for all of them. So Abraham says, suggested, you go one way, I'll go another. We'll separate from one another. You know how Lot cast his eyes over the rich valley of Jordan. He says, the Bible says he cast his lot, his tent towards Sodom. We read on it later, he's living in Sodom, right? Sodom was a very wicked city. And he's raising his children in a wicked city like Sodom. Now you hear parents today talking a lot like Lot probably did back then. They said, well, it's good for our children to experience the ways of the world. We don't need to shelter them from these things. Well, that's the philosophy of Lot. And it didn't turn out too good for him and his family, did it? Parents, you better shelter your children. You need to protect them from a lot that's going on in this world. You don't even have to get out of the house to see what this world has to offer. Just a it's piped right into your home through the television. Amen. Sodom will come right into your living room. Your kids can be damaged beyond measure. Right in your own home by what they see and what they hear on television and the internet. Amen. Would you invite a total stranger to come into your house? And allow him to use foul language. Tell filthy jokes in front of your children. He's drinking from a bottle of booze. He takes the Lord's name in vain. He ridicules your faith in Christ. Would you stand for that? Or would you ask him to leave? Well, what happens when we turn on that television set? We're inviting such people to come into our home. And do the very thing that I'm talking about through means of television and the internet. And many who profess to be Christians will sit there and laugh at the blasphemy and filthy talk of these people. You invite them into your home and laugh at what they say. God help us. God help us. But it goes on in many so-called Christian homes. Making a mockery of God. Well, it's easy to lose your Christian influence. People watch you. You know, someday you might find yourself in a position to help somebody who's going through some hard times. Friends, neighbors, relatives. Now, they know you're a Christian. You profess to be a Christian. But do they have any confidence in your Christianity? Enough to come to you and seek counseling and prayer? Not if you lose your testimony. They're not going to come to you. And you're going to lose a very important chance, an opportunity to minister to those that you care about. 
Folks, keeping your testimony is so important. Amen. Protect your testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. Lot didn't. Look what happened to Lot. Lot allowed his daughters to marry men of Sodom. And when God warned him of judgment to come, Lot tried to go to his married daughters and their husbands to warn them they need to flee Sodom because God is going, is going to destroy that city. How'd they respond? The Bible says they mocked him. They mocked him. Let me read it to you. Genesis 19, 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up! Get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They laughed at what Lot had to say. And he had to leave them behind. And they perished in the destruction of Sodom. It's sad, isn't it? Lot let his family go to hell. Lot allowed his city to go to hell because he was not the example, he was not the kind of believer that could make a difference. That's sad, isn't it? Remember Abraham was told about this judgment. Remember the story how he, he asked God, if, if we could find 50 righteous, would you spare the city? Remember that? How about 40? How about 30? He got down to 10, didn't he? God, if we could find ten righteous people in Sodom, would you spare the city? And the Lord said, yes, I will. Well, evidently, there were not ten righteous people there because it was destroyed. Do you realize that if Lot's family was serving the Lord, he had married daughters, he had unmarried daughters, he had two that went with him, sons, he had ten in his family. If his family had been true to God and serving God, they could have saved Sodom from being destroyed. But Lot had not been a good testimony to his own family. And he allowed his family to go to hell because he compromised. There's a lot of compromising going on today, amen? Now you can go on and live like you want to, but you're going to pay the price. Your family will probably pay the price. You're going to reap what you sow. Amen. Here's the third thing we can lose. You can lose your fellowship with Christ and his church. This is what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. He said, if we say we have fellowship with him, with the Lord... And walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now there's a lot of professed believers today who are not walking with the Lord. They don't really enjoy a close fellowship with the Lord. They don't have a close fellowship with God's people. Because of their lifestyle. See, some people live a way that their sin gets them out of church. See, if you got sin in your life and you come to church and hear the preaching of God's word, you're going to be convicted about that sin. And you're going to have to do one of two things. Either stop sinning or quit going to church. At least going to a church where it's going to convict you of your sins. There's a lot of searchers out there that won't do that. But a church that preaches the truth of God's word, there's going to be some conviction there concerning some things going on in your life. They cannot sit under the preaching of God's word because of this. They either got to stop sinning or stop going to church. And sadly, many choose to drop out of church. That's sad. They're doing things they should not be doing. Going to places they should not be going. Acting in a way they should not. It brings reproach upon Christ. And upon his church. You know, I'm concerned with the growing number of church members who go to these casinos. Some are more faithful to go to the casinos than they are going to church. 
Some give more money to the casino than they give to the Lord's church. That's sad, but it's true. That's wrong, it's sinful. But there are a lot of so-called church members that live a lifestyle that is open and public that brings reproach upon Christ and his church. There was a day in time they exercised church discipline. So what's that? Exactly. No, the Bible says we're to judge those within the church. God said, I'll take care of those without the church. You judge those within. You discipline your members. They're living a lifestyle that's bringing reproach upon the church. They need to be dealt with. We don't need to just look the other way and forget it. But not many churches exercise discipline these days because they don't want to lose people. I'll tell you what, folks. We have a church covenant. I don't know if you ever read it or not, but it ought to mean something. We all agreed to abide by that church covenant when we joined the church. But I want to read it sometimes. But today, many are not living in a way that brings glory and honor to our Lord. And they'll get out of church and they don't really miss the fellowship of God's people. Matter of fact, they prefer the fellowship of the devil's goats over the fellowship of the Lord's sheep. They might be more at home at the casino than they are here because they're with their crowd there. Amen. But tell you what, fellowship's important. We need the fellowship of one another. We need the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. But some will drop out of church. They say, well, I can sit at home and watch it on television. Maybe they've got a TV preacher they like to listen to. But what about the fellowship you miss? You don't have that at home in your living room. You've got to come to the house of God to find the fellowship with God's people. But some, it doesn't seem to be very important to them. By the way, we do have some shut-ins that cannot be here. That, that wish they could physically come, but they can't. And they watch us on television or on the internet. And I'm glad we can do that for them. But they'd rather be here. They'd rather be here. They miss the fellowship. That's what they tell me. I miss the fellowship. Being with God's people. That's important. That's why the Lord left the church behind when he went back to heaven. A place where we can come and fellowship with one another and worship with one another. You can lose that if you allow sin in your life. Can you be out of fellowship with God's people and still be in fellowship with God? This is what the Bible says in 1 John 4.20. It says, if a man say, I love God and hates or is indifferent toward his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? Now according to this, if you're not in fellowship with your brethren, you're going to have trouble with fellowship with God. It's going to affect your fellowship with God. So, if there's sin in your life and you're tempted to just quit coming to church, that's a wrong answer to your problems. Do like David. Confess the sin in your life. Seek God's forgiveness. Forsake it. And stay in fellowship with God's people. You know, some people, they quit church. They get offended. They say, well, I don't go to church because I was offended. Yeah, I don't think I don't accept that. I really don't. People lay out of church because there's something wrong between them and God. Amen. There's something wrong between them and God. That's why they're not here. They may not admit it, but that's the truth. You get offended here. We're not the only church in town. Amen. You don't have to sit at home. If we were the only church in town, I could understand that, but we're not. That's just an excuse to not be here. 
Folks, Christ receives glory through the church. Amen. You don't go to church to please others. You shouldn't go to church to please yourself. We're here to please the Lord. We're here to worship Him, to give thanks unto Him, to praise Him, that He might get honor and glory from our presence. That's why we should be here. Here's the fourth thing you can lose. You can lose eternal rewards. Are you laying up treasure in heaven like Jesus said? Jesus said in Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man as his work shall be. God's going to reward us according to our faithful service in this life. Now, you cannot work for redemption, but you can work for rewards. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose rewards and a position in God's kingdom. Let me give you some verses. You might want to jot these down in your notes. 2 John verse 8 says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You can lose rewards. 1 Corinthians 3.15 says, If any man's work shall be burned, it's talking about at the judgment seat of Christ, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. He doesn't lose his salvation. Yet so as by fire. He doesn't lose his salvation, he loses his reward because of his lifestyle. Colossians 2.18 it says, let no man beguile you of your reward. Don't let anyone beguile you and steal your reward from you. Because of their ungodly example, because of their heretical teachings. Be faithful unto Christ. Now a lot of people are more concerned about laying up treasure on earth than they are in heaven. Right? Right? But there's treasures we can lay up in heaven that'll be there waiting for us when we come. I heard about a guy who was told he didn't have long to live. So he told his wife to take half the money they've got out of the bank, put it in a bag, and place it right above his bed in the attic. His plan was when he died and his spirit left the body, he would grab that bag of money on his way to heaven. You might want to think about that. Well, he died. She had done what he said. She put a bag of money right above his bed. So after he died, she went up to check, and sure enough, the bag was still there. She said, I knew he should have put it in the basement. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter which direction you go. You can't take it with you. But you can send it ahead. You do that by laying up treasure in heaven through your giving of your time, of your talents, of your tithes. All that you're giving unto the Lord is laying up treasure in heaven. This is what Jesus says about that. Matthew 6, 19. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Lay up your treasures in heaven. Now, if you don't serve the Lord, you're robbing yourself of these rewards. Be faithful. Lay up treasure in heaven that'll be waiting for you when you get there. Here's the final thought you can lose your physical life. Now, you cannot lose your everlasting life, but you can lose your physical life because of sin. The Bible says, 1 John 5, 16, that there is a sin unto death. So, well, preacher, what sin are we talking about? Is it murder? Is that the sin unto death? Is it some, some terrible sin that we need to avoid? It's not talking about any particular sin. It's talking about sin in general. 
The idea, you can cross the line in sin that you do not confess, do not repent of. You can cross God's deadline and it becomes a sin unto death. Remember Moses? Now Moses was a great man of God, wasn't he? Do you know Moses committed a sin unto death? When God told him to speak to the rock and Moses smote the rock in anger, God said, because you've done this, I'm not going to allow you to go into the promised land. You're going to die. You'll not go in. He committed a sin unto death. Now, did Moses go to hell? Well, if you're here last week, we saw Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, didn't we? <laughs> that tells us Moses didn't go to hell. He's with Elijah. They came out of paradise to meet with Jesus. But he committed a sin unto death. Ananias and Sapphira, remember them? Book of Acts. When they lied concerning how much they had given to the church. Peter said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And immediately Ananias was killed. They carried him out and buried him. His wife came in, did the same thing. Immediately she dropped dead. They committed the sin unto death. That can happen, can it? We need to be careful about allowing sin in our lives. Remember the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. Paul said because the way they were treating the Lord's Supper, he says in verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now he's talking about the Lord's Supper, how they were treating the Lord's Supper. It goes on to say, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Many died in that church. They committed a sin unto death in the way they were treating the Lord's Supper. Life's cut short because of unconfessed sin. We had a young man many years ago, was saved and baptized here. He was a friend of one of our sons. He uh, had trouble at home with his parents. They kicked him out. I guess he's about 18, 19 years old. And uh, we allowed him to stay with us for a while. We tried to help him. We had a revival meeting. Brother Mike Raines was our evangelist. And this young man was staying with us. And after church at home, we were sitting around talking with Brother Mike. And this young man said, you know, you said something in your sermon about those who honor father and mother could have a long life. He said, kind of convicted me, he said, I've not honored my parents. Matter of fact, he got into a fist fight with his father and actually beat his dad up. I mean, really beat him up bad. And they kicked him out. He said, I guess I won't live a long life, not the way I've treated my parents. It wasn't very long after that, he left our home, was staying with others. And we got word that he was working on his car in the garage. Had it up on floor jacks. He was underneath the car trying to get something off of it. Tugging it, he pulled it off the floor jacks, and it crushed him. 18, 19 years old. The preacher, did he commit a sin unto death? I don't know. I couldn't say. But it does happen. God can cut your life short because of unconfessed sin in your life. I looked it up, that was back in 1994. But George Peavy and I went and talked to his parents. We led his parents and his sister to the Lord. They were baptized here. But it's a sad thing to see a life cut short. And sometimes it's God who will call his children home early because of sin. Now it's true that if you're saved, you're saved forever. You have everlasting life. But there are things you can lose if you allow sin in your life. 
Moses committed a sin unto death probably when he struck that rock. He lost his life but not his salvation. As I said, we know that because we see him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Let me ask you something. Have you lost something in your life due to sin? Are you reaping some bad seed right now? You know you're not right with God. You know you're not living a life that is faithful in his service. Are you in danger of losing something? First of all, do you have everlasting life? If not, you stand to lose your very soul. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Don't lose your soul. Give it to Jesus. How many of you given your soul to Jesus for safekeeping? Would you raise your hand? Amen. If you couldn't raise your hand, you're not saved. You can be saved today. You'll just come accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. 